Greetings, nerdlings. Today, we are going to be talking about classification of organisms, or the study of taxonomy. There are 13 billion known species of organisms on this earth right now, and that's only 5% of the amount of organisms that have ever lived on earth. There are still new organisms being found every day and being named by scientists or regular people like you and me. So just what is classification? It's the arrangement of organisms into orderly groups based on their similarities. Classification is also known as taxonomy, and that's what us biologists refer to it as. A person who studies or identifies and names organisms is called a taxonomist. So taxonomists study taxonomy, or classifying organisms. So why would we want to classify organisms in the first place? It gives us an accurately and uniformly way to name the organisms, and it helps us prevent misnomers, such as a seahorse. Because a seahorse isn't really a horse, now is it? Just like a starfish isn't a fish, and a jellyfish isn't a fish. Starfish and jellyfish are invertebrates, and they're not fish at all. So it helps us to prevent confusion. So if you look over here, we have a bunch of different scientists from a bunch of different countries trying to figure out what to call this. In France, they call it un moffet. In German, ein stinker. In America, we call it a skunk. So as you could imagine, there's many, many names for the skunk. It might be stinkus stinkus or nasty smellus. So how do we figure out what one country is talking about if we live in another and we speak two totally different languages. We use taxonomy. We give it a two name name. So we call the skunk Metaphistus Metaphistus. So whether we're in Germany or Italy or America, if we're talking to another scientist about a skunk, we're going to use the scientific name Metaphistus Metaphistus. So there were a lot of people who contributed to taxonomy. The very first known taxonomist was Aristotle, this guy right here. He should sound familiar to you. He lived about 2,000 years ago, and he divided organisms into plants and animals. Once he divided them into those two categories, he then further divided them based on where they lived. He classified them based on whether they were land dwellers, sea dwellers, or air dwellers. Another taxonomist was called Jean Ray. He was a botanist. Botanists study plants. And he was the first one to use this Latin naming system. Now, instead of using only two names, he used many. And his descriptions were long. And they told you everything about a plant. So if you were walking along the way and you saw a rose and you say, hey, that rose was pretty. Instead of using the word rose, you would say, hey, that plant with red petals that smells good and is very beautiful with thorns and is in a bush looks beautiful today. So as you could imagine, people don't want to sit around and talk about a rose by saying the beautiful plant with pretty petals which smells good has thorns and is in a bush so they came up with a different classification system. Carolus Linnaeus is the one who came up with the classification system that we use today. He was an 18th century taxonomist and he classified organisms based on their structure. He developed a naming system that we use today currently. And he also wrote this book, The Systema Nature. In this book, he basically classified as many organisms as he knew existed and gave them a two-name name. So Carolus Linnaeus is called the father of taxonomy. Now in this year, we've learned of two other fathers that we've spoken about. The father of genetics, who was Darwin, and Sorry about that. The father of genetics, who is Mendel. Mendel was the monk who studied his peas. And the father of evolution, who was Darwin. 
So just like they are fathers of their individual studies, Carolus Linnaeus is the father of taxonomy, and he developed the system of naming known as binomial nomenclature, bi meaning two and nomial meaning names. And he developed this naming system to create the genus and the species names for each organism. Binomial nomenclature uses the genus and the species. It's either Latin or Greek. If you print it out or type it, you always want to type it in italics. And you always capitalize the genus and you leave the species in the lowercase form. If you're handwriting it, you need to make sure that you underline both the genus and the species. So for example, Turtus migratorius is a bird. It's a robin. So Turtus is going to be its genus name, and as you can see, it's capitalized. Migratorius is going to be its species name, and it is not capitalized. You can also see that it's in italics. So these are a couple of other examples of binomial nomenclature. This is commonly called the panda, but its binomial nomenclature is Arapolda melanoleuca. The polar bear is called Ursus maritimus, and the grizzly bear is called Ursus arctos. So which two of these are more closely related? If you look at their scientific names, you would see that both the polar bear and the grizzly bear have the genus name of Ursus, so those two would be more closely related to each other than they would to the panda over here. So there are rules, yes rules, for naming organisms. The International Code for the Binomial Nomenclature contains the rules for naming organisms. All names must be approved by the International Naming Congresses, International Zoological Congress. Yes folks, there is actually a job where you sit around all day in an International Naming Congress and make sure that no one has duplicated a name of an organism. So in modern classification, taxonomists identify and classify organisms based on several characteristics. They use external structures, internal structures, where the organism lives, and they also consider the genetic makeup, or DNA sequences, to review evolutionary relationships. They look at structural similarities. This is basically how those animals are made up physically. Those are the physical features that the species have in common. For example, we have our bobcat and our lynx. They are very similar in their features. Breeding behavior is also a consideration. So for example, male frogs in the same pond made different sounds to attract females of their own group. We also look at geographical distribution. One of the most well-known examples of this are the finches of the Galapagos Island, which Darwin, the father of evolution, studied. We look at chromosome similarity, or the DNA makeup of those organisms. So for example, broccoli, kale, cabbage, and cauliflower don't really look that much alike, but they actually have chromosomes that are almost identical in structure. We also look at the biochemistry. So again, for example, we have a red panda and a giant panda. Even though red pandas and pandas are called pandas, the red pandas are more closely related to a raccoon, while giant pandas are more closely related to bears. So how are living things classified? Living organisms are divided into groups that we call taxa. Singular, we use the word taxon. And they range from the broadest to the most specific broadest being the domain, and the most specific being the species. The smallest taxon, again, is the species, and organisms look alike and are able to interbreed if they belong to the same species. The next largest taxon would be the genus, which is a group of similar related species. So a taxon is a category into which related organisms are placed. We also call it taxa if we're referring to multiple taxon. There is a hierarchy of groups, or taxa, from broadest to most specific. Those go from domain, being the most broad, then kingdom, 
then phylum, then class, order, family, genus, and species. Again, the domain is the broadest taxon, meaning it encompasses everything else, while the species is the most specific. So multiple species make up the genuses or genre, multiple genera belong to families, families belong to orders, orders belong to classes, there are multiple classes within phyla, multiple phyla within kingdoms, and multiple kingdoms within each domain. So if you look at this example here, this is us basically going from the most broad or the domain to the most specific. This would be domain eukarya, meaning everything that is composed of eukaryotic cells. And then kingdom animalia. Everything in here is classified as an animal. The sea star, the coral snake, the albert squirrel, the red fox, the giant panda, the black bear, and the grizzly bear. Then we get a little bit more specific which is phylum chordata. In the phylum chordata, everything has a backbone. That's what chordates are. So the one guy that doesn't have a backbone that gets left off is the starfish because it's an invertebrate, meaning it does not have a backbone. Then we get a little bit more specific, class mammalia, meaning that everything in class mammalia is a mammal or warm-blooded. Snakes, not so warm-blooded. Then we get a little bit more specific, order carnivora, meaning that these guys eat meat, and they are adapted to eat meat. They have those large incisors, the shearing teeth that they can rip things apart with. We get a little bit more specific, family ursidae, which is referring to bears. Then we get even more specific, we go into the genus, genus ursus. There are two bears that belong to the genus ursus, the grizzly bear, and the black bear. Then we go into species, Ursus arctos. This would be the grizzly bear. So Ursus arctos belongs to the genus Ursus, which belongs to the family Ursidae, which belongs to the order Carnivora, which belongs to the class Mammalia, which belongs to the phylum Chordata, which belongs to the kingdom Animalia, which belongs to the domain Eukarya. Very complicated. There are also many mnemonic devices that people use to try and remember the taxonomic order. So this is just one of them. Dumb King Philip came over from Greece singing. You guys can come up with your own mnemonic device, but if this works for you, that's awesome. So here's another classification example of us, humans. So we are in domain eukarya, meaning cells with a nucleus or eukaryotic cells. Kingdom animalia, which are multiple cells, motile, and we ingest our food, meaning we're heterotrophs. We cannot produce our own food. Phylum chordata, meaning we has a, have a dorsal supporting rod and a nerve cord. Class mammalia, meaning we have hair and mammary glands, or breasts, that produce milk. Order primates, which means that we were adapted at one point in time along the evolutionary history to climb trees. This does not mean that we came from monkeys. This means that we shared a common ancestor and everybody branched off. Family hominidae. This means we were adapted to walk upright or erect. Genus homo, meaning that we have a large brain and we can use tools. Now we can use power tools. And eventually we have this species, sapiens. And this means that our body proportions are that of modern humans. So this ends our first part of taxonomy and classification. Stay tuned while I walk you through the different kingdoms of living organisms. I'll see you guys soon.